Well, hey, Nanisa and Ethan Walk, Nanana, on and then. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Sean Tamler, and I'm the uh, I'm from the White Clay people. I'm the president here at Ani Nakota College, and we welcome you here uh, for this another interview talk by one of our Nakota elders today. Uh, the purpose of these elder lectures is to give our students and our community an opportunity uh, opportunity to learn and be inspired by our Aani and Nakota elders. We would like to share stories of our elders in terms of the practice of their indigenous life ways, their education, their success as they encountered the good and negative challenge challenges of their life experience. So traditional stories, ceremonial and spiritual knowledge may be shared, but regardless of any topics that arise, there always was there, there's always this common thread that indigenous, indigenous life ways were the foundation that made, they needed to become prosperous and generous. So today, our, uh, we are, we are uh, thankful and blessed to have with us uh, Nakota elder Donovan Archambault. He's uh, an educator, a pipe maker, an artist, and a uh, former councilman for maybe a total of uh, 16 years that he was on the council. And one of those terms was actually our, our president of our, our tribe. So with that, thank you, Donovan. I, we uh, welcome you here today. Thank you. And uh, I don't know if you wanna tell a little bit, uh, introduce yourself or anything briefly. However. Yeah, I, I, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm glad that you're doing this uh, also because, you know, a lot of our kids don't know even who they are today uh, because we don't teach any of these things. And so I started learning uh, things like uh, traditional culture, religion, when I was a little boy, when I could first understand what people were talking about. And I was fortunate. Uh, I lived with my grandmother for a while. And, uh, my parents were still together. But uh, in terms of uh, introduction, I'm uh, Donovan Archambault, and I've lived uh, both sides of the fence, the good side, the bad side. Uh, I, I'm an alcoholic. I'm sober today and have been for the last 40 some years. But during that span, uh, I pushed aside a lot of the things that I learned as a child about who we were as a people. And uh, it took me uh, a good 20 years to finally find out who I was, who I am. And in learning that, I learned a lot of things about myself. Well, like I said earlier, I lived with my grandmother and then when I was a little boy, I remember back in the early 40s when all the men folks were gone, they were at, in the army. And <clears throat> uh, so we, we stayed with our grand folks, my mother and all of her sisters, because all of their husbands were in the service too. So all the grandchildren, we all lived down there with her and she was, she had about, I don't remember the exact amount, but it seemed like, you know, there was probably 20, 30 of us down there, all little kids, almost the same age, you know, we, we, we weren't in school yet, but uh, uh, some of the older ones were in school, but as younger ones, we, we, we uh, she was our Head Start teacher. She took us and told us uh, what plants 
she needed for her uh, healing and, and uh, doctoring, and she would teach us what to what they were for. And I uh, I listened pretty well, but I didn't hear much. And there's a big difference between listening and hearing. And so when I did uh, start my journey in life, I uh, started drinking and, and uh, doing things that I was taught earlier in my lifetime that I shouldn't do. And it took me on quite a trail. And uh, I was very fortunate. I feel very blessed that I was able to correct all the things that I was doing wrong. And then I began to think about what I was really taught when I was a little boy. And probably the four words that meant so much to me were good and bad, right and wrong. My grandma told me, she said, if you remember those things, she said, you'll follow a good road. But if you get away from that, she said, you're, you don't know where you're going to end up. And so I thought about all those things and where I'd been, what I've done. And uh, she was right. One thing she told me, another thing she told me was that you know, you listen to this right here, she said. That's your spirit, your spirit's in there. Some say their conscience, their heart, they, whatever, she said. But if you listen to this, it's going to tell you what good, bad, right, and wrong. And, and so I've always done that. After I you know, start beginning to correct my life again, and I think we need to start teaching those kind of things in our schools to our little kids again, because uh, <clears throat> we we have two different ways of life, two cultures, and I call it good culture, bad culture. The good culture was when I was able to live a good life and uh, learn. And so when I did sober up, I went back to all the things that I remembered from my early years, real early, four or five years old, and uh, start to take those words and put them in place again, right and wrong, good and bad. And from all of those things came, <clears throat> uh, those words came the other words that I remember, honesty, truthfulness, spirituality, know who you are, know your relatives, all rules that we were taught. And most of the tribes have rules like that. We have a lot of rules, all the tribes. And they're basically the same thing. But we, we, uh, in our, in our quest for education and everything, we kind of push those things aside and uh, they're laying on the side of the road of our, our, our life road. And uh, we need to stand them back up again and start using those things. We need to uh, pass it on to our children, the significance of their spirituality, the significance of knowing who they are. I asked one boy, I teach a class over there, and I asked this one student, and he was a, well, a client, I guess, not a student, a client, he was a grown-up man. I'm a strong son of boy and warrior, I'm this and that, and well, why are you here? Because they were sentenced to the class, and he was there because he was an abuser. And I said, strong Cinnaboyan warriors don't beat their family. 
They don't beat their children or their wives. And you have to learn that. You have to live by that. And so when I started thinking about uh, where we where we are today with all the uh, negative things that are numbers that are written about us and our dropout rates and mortality rates and obesity, cancer, all these things, they exist now more prevalent than um, when I remember as a little boy. I never even heard the word of cancer. I never heard the word uh, of suicide. And, those, we didn't know what they were. And now, everybody, the little kids, they tell you, don't know, I'm gonna go commit suicide. I don't know if they mean it or not, but they say it. And those are things that we don't need to hear. They don't need to say. And so I think if we, if we, if we can go back to teaching the way, give us a, at least an hour to teach some of these things that we don't teach now. Now you talk to kids, if you correct them, you don't like them. He's mean. I even had my son tell me, I'm gonna take you to court if you spank me. <laughs> and so that's how far we strayed from what was good and bad and right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And so we have to go back to those things. And you know, speaking of how, you know, the the things that you learned growing up from your grandma, and what was her name, by the way? Melvina, Melvina Horn. Okay, and so you, you grew up, uh, and she, you said she, she was your first teacher, and and, um, and you grew up around this area, right? In the... I did. In fact, uh, I used to even have... Uh, your uncle Ronnie was one of my good friends here. Your mother was our friend. Um, your dad and my dad were good friends. Went hunting together and mechanic together and drank together and everything. Yeah. But, but yeah, I grew up here uh, till I went to boarding school in 1949, I think. But between the time I remember to boarding school, that was probably the best uh, years of my life that I, up to that point where I could you know, really uh, understand what was going on and, and, and uh, what I was being taught. And then I went to boarding school and everything changed, it just complete change. I went to Pure Indian School in South Dakota. I was 10 years old and uh, those three years I was there, I never got to come home. And I think I got one letter from home from my mother. My parents separated and that's the reason we had to go. Uh, my uncles, some of my aunts and uncles wanted to take us because that's the way they did it a long time ago. If you didn't have your mother was gone or something, all of your aunts were your mother. And if your, uncle, if your dad was gone or died or something, your uncles were your dad, all of them. And we didn't do that. They wouldn't let them, they wouldn't let my uncle take us, even though they said, well, one more mile, they be nothing to feed. No, you gotta go, you got too many mouths to feed anyway. So I had to go, I had a choice between uh, either uh, going to a foster home or going to a boarding school. And I didn't want to go to a foster home. I heard a lot of stories about that. And uh, so I chose to go to boarding school. That's where I went. Yeah. And I went there for three years and never came home. Uh, probably the most brutal time of my whole life. And I was you know, between 10 and 13 years old or 14 years old. And, uh, but we survived. And we forgot a lot of the things that we learned because we, I didn't know how to talk Indian, but I could understand pretty well. And when I came home, 
my grandma asked me to get her some water because we had to haul water from the dam. She wanted me to get her a bucket of water. And she, so in Indian, she told me to give her water. So I went over and I got her a dipper full of water. I handed her that dipper. And she told my mother, she said something in Indian I didn't understand, but she told my mother and my mother laughed and she said, I said, what did she say? She said, you went to school to learn. You come back dumber than when you left. She said, so uh, by them taking that away from me in her eyes, you know, I didn't learn nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that was, uh, I think uh, a lot of us uh, sacrificed that, you know, not, on, not, not because we wanted to, but it was a forced, it was a forced uh, choice that we had, and it ruined a lot of a lot of some of my friends that I went to boarding school with. Never made it this far. Most I don't can't remember any of them uh, except your dad. You know that really uh, made it as far as we are, and he's older than I am. Your dad is a couple years older than I am, uh, and. That's what I it's found. Where, where we're at. You know? That's what I was going to say. That's what I always found amazing that, you know, a lot didn't make it like you guys did, but it's amazing you guys made it. And, and I always think, well, how did they, how did they make it? Otherwise, you know, I wouldn't be around. And um, yeah, it's because, yeah, my dad tells me a lot of those little mm -hmm. stories and mm -hmm. uh, he describes, and that's what I was going to ask you. Could you describe how you, were taken from here all the way to South Dakota. How did you, what was the mode of transportation or what was that, uh, what was that trip? <clears throat> they had all the yellow school buses like you have today that went about 30 miles an hour or so. And I remember we left here about 10 o'clock and we got to uh, someplace around Hinsdale about Two, two thirty or something. We had lunch there. Uh, no farmers, farmers, uh, our stubble field. We pulled the buses out there and they pulled out sack lunches that they made about ten days before they left. And they were, they had, they were still in there. They went all the way to Flathead and came back and was picking us up all the way through. All those. Sandwiches were about like shingles trying to eat them. And so I ate my apple and uh, it was a little soggy, but it was at least I could eat it. And I did drink milk. I hated milk. So I had to tough it out till we got to Wolf Point where we slept that night and, uh, before I could have a drink. Because <laughs> yeah. we didn't stop any place. We just kept going. Great. I know my dad says that the ones that took him over there, they were those, um, like a big, uh, what do you call them, an army? Um... Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had them. He, he went a couple of years before I did, and they got away from those. Uh, they were like a big cattle truck. Yeah. They had no top on it. And they, they had a canvas over it, but it was open. And it was a, just like a cattle truck. Mm -hmm. And uh, But... <clears throat> uh, they got everything from the army, see, you know, all that surplus stuff, some of our food. Yeah. My first Thanksgiving, I was thinking, boy, turkey and all the trimmings. We got canned turkey. It came in a big brown can about that tall. And that's what we had for Thanksgiving. Oh. So I was pretty disappointed. And uh, even though, you know, before we went, we had a tough life. It was drinking and fighting and all of this. And I was really glad to be going to getting away to get away from that. But before that first day was over, I wish I was back home. I wish I was there with all the fighting and drinking and everything. Because that it started getting bad. The very first day, things started getting different than what they were at home. Yeah. That's why, you know, I I admire that about you guys that you survived all that and um 
I always, that's why I always think uh, I hold you guys in high regard because you, know, you guys uh, toughed out and went through yeah. stuff so that I, my generation wouldn't have to do that. So. Yeah, we had to. We did that. I think uh, we had no way to turn. You know, there was there was just like anywhere else. There was bullying, molesting, and sexual abuse, all that stuff. It was all right in the school. And here we were, about three hundred boys or so, all in a couple of buildings, and each building had one matron and one advi one boys advisor. And so the rest of the time, you were left to, you know, your own uh, survival. However you survived, that's, you know, you had to do it. And there was, because you had nobody to tell. You couldn't, couldn't tell. I ran away a couple of times and because I, <clears throat> I didn't like it. And I got caught. I, I, the first time I ran away, I made it 56 miles uh, from the school. But I got on the Missouri River. And the only thing I knew is that I had to go upstream to, and maybe I could make it far as Cow Creek because we used to go fishing over here, Cow Creek. And I said, well, I know where that is. And if I get there, I didn't know it was probably 700 miles away the river went. And I don't know how long it took me to go that far, but yeah. anyway, I, we starved out about the fourth day and we got up on the highway and they picked us up, called a school and we were, had black and blue marks from your waist all the way down to your ankles. And because they, they really fixed us, we really took our shoes away and our clothes. All we had was a nightshirt, knelt on the steps for 30 days. And we didn't really have to do 30 days because some other kids had done a bigger crime than we did. Yeah. And they got caught. So they took our place on the steps. And yeah. So we kind of yeah. got off on easy on that first one. but. Two days after I got my shoes back, I was running again. And uh, that time they really fixed us. Well, I tell you, I, I just made up my mind, well, I'm going to have to just tough it out because I don't want to get beat up again. I, next time they might kill me. So I, I, I just toughed it out like everybody else, you know. Yeah. And then that's why I said it was, you know, a real brutal, a real brutal time. I mean, just a little kid, you think of a little kid getting bent over to and just man, somebody pounding on you. And that's what it was. Is it, um, so you said you went, you went there till you're about 13, 14. Yeah. Did you go uh, to high school here or to? Uh... No, I went from there right to Flandreau. Another another boarding school. So, and then from Flandreau, I went two years to Flandreau, and then I went to Standing Rock at the Fort Yates, and I graduated there in twelfth grade. Oh, okay. But, but the whole second half of my uh, uh, education uh, was in boarding schools, from the sixth grade on, clear till I graduated in. Uh, but it got better once we got out of that pier. Flandreau was like heaven. When I got to Flandreau, it was so different and you had a lot of freedom and you didn't march every place in pier. Of course, we were little kids and I guess maybe that's how they kept track of us or whatever, but it was just like in the army. You had to fix your bed. And when I got in the military, I think I was a soldier of the guard every time I had guard duty I was the sharpest soldier there because I already knew how to shine my shoes and iron my clothes and everything else so it just went from from boarding school to college and to army and you knew all that stuff and yeah. I remember some guys in the army were they'd sit there and cry because they had so frustrated they couldn't do nothing right and just like we were in boarding school yeah. at, uh, I pitied those guys because some of them were 17, 18 years old. You couldn't do nothing but just sit there and cry. <laughs> so boarding school was just kind of like the army. And um, how long did you spend in the army? I spent three years in the army. I spent uh, 
three years in Germany, 31 months in Germany. And, uh, but I like that. It was, Europe, Europe is small. It's kind of, I mean, you could get in a, get a rent a car and take off and be in Paris the next morning. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It was all close. You go to, I went to Amsterdam and Spain and Italy and Switzerland. I went all over. And then I got on the boxing team and uh, we went all over on boxing matches, different units, you know, 4th Armored Division, 1st Infantry, all of the different big units, you know, V Corps, 10th Corps, uh, Berlin Brigade. I fought in Berlin when I was over there. So the Army was pretty good. I got to go all over and do things that I never would have got gotten to do if I did wasn't in there. But uh, it also, you know, uh, taught you a lot of discipline and things like that. And, uh, things that we were, that were hammered into us in boarding school. And um, boarding school was bad, you know, but we still got some, there was still some good things out of it, I thought. Uh, you learned to be very independent. If you got stealing, you put your hands on there, and boom, 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 they crack your knuckles for you. <laughs> and uh, so we didn't steal, most of us anyway. And uh, But all that stuff was kind of hammered into you. And it was beat into you, literally, just physically pounded into you. And so <clears throat> uh, that's what made it so, you know, so hard to to uh, get by and you had no way to nobody to tell or nobody to you couldn't share anything if you if I told somebody I was going to run away they went and told the matron or the advisor I was in trouble so you kept everything in you and it just kind of uh, I become a very angry person you know and uh, when I started drinking all that stuff, that's the only way I could kind of feel good about who I was because they downgraded us so bad in boarding school and then in the army and even in college, you know, college you were, I was the only Indian until my brother came in, in the school and everybody was, you know, I was a curiosity to people and uh, it, uh, it made you build up all this barrier around you so you became if you didn't have it you didn't need it you know you become very independent and uh, that that's something that uh, I don't know if it was good or bad but at least uh, I could survive I could get by just thinking well I don't need it I don't need it yeah and other people stole and went and stole or but they ended up in jail and uh, I remember <clears throat> things like when my grandmother told me that whatever you get, you earn. Nothing's free. You can go over and steal that car, but you're going to be sitting in jail. But if you work hard and you save your money, go buy it. It's yours. And that's how they taught us to, you know, to try not to steal and that carried through with, even when I was in the army, I, uh, there was all kinds of opportunities to do it. But uh, I always thought about how it would look to my grandma if I, if I did that. One thing she told me about drinking and passing out in town and bar or something, you represent me, why are you doing that? I don't do that. And so those kind of things kind of made you think about who you were. And it, it really helped me sober up and become who I am today. Yeah. What, um, you mentioned you went to, you went to college. What, where did you go to college and what made you uh, go in, in the first place or, and continue and be successful? Well, I didn't want to go to college 
in the beginning, uh, I wanted to be a rancher, a cowboy, because uh, when I was after boarding school, uh, even during boarding school, when I came home for the summer, I either stayed with one of my aunts or our uncles. They always had livestock. And so I got to ride and brand and uh, wrestle cat, everything. And that's what I wanted to do. So when I graduated at Standing Rock at 48th, uh, my aunt had a nice herd of cattle down there. I, I stayed with her and her husband. And uh, they gave me horses and saddles and everything. And uh, so I wanted to be a cowboy. I wanted to raise cows. So my dad and I, when I graduated, we came back and we put in a big application. That was in uh, 1957. Put in a big application. It was going to have 20 head of cows and two horses and some, you know, do regular. Uh, in them days, a cow, you could buy a cow for 20 bucks. You know. uh, but the superintendent had to approve my loan because it was through the government um, and he wouldn't do it. He said, you need to go to college. And I was on the honor roll in high school almost every six weeks for the, uh, at least the last two years of my school. You know, and, uh, you have to go get an education. No, I'm not going to approve. So he wouldn't approve it. So I told my dad, I said, well, hell, I, I don't know what to do. He said, maybe I'll just uh, go find a job. Well, he said, uh, the school down here wants you for, want me for boxing, and it's a state school of forestry, and they're going to give you a little scholarship. Why don't you go over there? You like to be outside, be a forest ranger. And so that's how I got into college. <laughs> I had no no uh, uh, idea that I was going to go to college. I wanted to go out and start raising cattle and be. And I eventually got to that point. I eventually had my own cows. I had 125 head and lived in a place, little place down in the valley here, and uh, never became rich. But it was very satisfying. My kids still talk about it today. And uh, so it went all the way around the loop. I finally got to do what I wanted to do in life. Yeah. There's a lot of detours, but I made it. And uh, I always stick, it all stuck in my mind that I'm going to go home and do that. One of these days, I'm going to do that. Yeah. Even though I was drinking and running around and working on all over the country, I, my my mother and grandmother and them, they never knew where I was because I didn't want to be a burden to them, you know, with my drinking and stuff. So I just kind of stayed away, and survived on my you know, old boarding school technique, I guess. Yeah. And what is your education? Pardon? What, is, what was your uh, education? In? So it was in forestry? Yeah, it was in forestry. And then I... I took a detour and went into social work and oh. something easy because I was, you know how you get to college and you get to running around with a few people yeah. and uh, instead of being on the dean's list, I was on the other end of it. Yeah. I was on probation list and so I went and I took something that I didn't have to work so hard at and uh, and it was good, it was a good, uh, and I, I came home, uh, I went to work, <clears throat> I went to work out in California for a couple of years, or about six, seven years, I guess, and I was out there during the hippie days, the Alcatraz and all of that, and that's a whole different story, you know, but I was there and I worked, I worked for the state of California, and I worked uh, for the university. I was a, the, uh, uh, 
I had the College of Arts and Science personnel officer for the College of Arts and Science on the Davis campus. And oh. They had seven schools and we had seven, they called us personnel officers. I didn't know. I, I just, but uh, <clears throat> Ronald Reagan, I remember, was a governor and he wanted all all programs under the state, every state program he wanted, 20% minority. And so every Friday, my boss would come in and tell me, get out on the street. He said, you go find some jobs. We need you like three cabinets here full of applications. So the new applications they had after the signing of the Civil Rights Bill and the Equal Rights, and you couldn't have age, you couldn't have uh, uh, whether you were black or Indian, or you couldn't have any of that on there. But you knew as a personnel officer, I knew where all of my, my uh, clients or my uh, students were. And so I, I'd go out and I'd find a job for somebody, I'd come back and I'd always take a minority. And I remember this one professor in, um, I can't remember, botany or one of the sciences anyway. He made a, a job for his daughter. I said, you can't do that. Said, you have to advertise this. Well, I advertise it, he said. And I'll just deny every application. I said, you can't do that either. I said, <laughs> but anyway, we had a big fight over it. And I finally got somebody hired in that class. And it was a little black woman. She was, uh, she had a, uh, she was working on her, I mean, she, might, she might have completed it. But anyway, she was uh, a, um, Technician, medical technician is uh, what she was. And, and uh, so I kept sending him these applications and I knew who they were. And uh, he finally had to hire one. And one day I was, and we, we had a real altercation, I mean, a physical altercation because I sent him all these minorities. And I was sitting in a student union with uh, the Indian students. I had to go down and have lunch with the Indian students. And here he come. I said, oh, God, I'm going to get into it again. And he came up, he put his hands on my shoulder from the back. He said, I want to thank you. He said, I said, well, thank you. I said, what? The only, she said, that individual you sent to me is the best technician that I have ever had. And I said, well, you, and this guy was from Alabama or someplace. He was head of the zoology department. I can't remember what it was. But, uh, anyway, that got me a promotion. I got promoted. To, and then one morning I was going to work. I lived in uh, West Sacramento and Davis was about 15 miles west of there. It's just like, I have to go home. Just like something hit me between the eyes and said, so I, I left and I came home. And the rest of you know, I've been here. I mean, you've been here, I've been here. I got into tribal government uh, because I thought I could make a difference. And in some cases that I did, you know, I think we have an insurance company that I started and uh, we have, uh, <clears throat> I know I've done some things in land that uh, we didn't have before, but you know, it, it's, uh, it's hard to, it's hard to uh, uh, help. I hate to say that, but it's hard to help uh, like, and being in the government. 
as an employee, I worked as a tribal health director, and a tribal planning director. I always hit a roadblock, and that's what made me go into politics. I said, well, I'll get on the council, then I can get this done. And so I was successful in a lot of the things that I wanted to do. And <clears throat> so being on that council is a pretty, pretty, uh, you have to have a thick skin to, yeah, to uh, do that job. And uh, I don't remember, I had some very good teachers uh, who tolerated my ignorance, you know, and trying to uh, get things done. But people like, uh, Davy Holly and John Allen, and I hope you don't mind me using their name, but they taught me how to, you know, how to get around things and how to make things work, really. And uh, we don't have those guys anymore. Uh, I guess maybe I'm one. They were in there. Probably I was in my 30s when I, when I was on the council the first time in 1976, and. Uh, they were probably in their 50s or 60s, you know, old John Capture, those guys, they, they, uh, they, they're the ones that taught us, you know. Well, did, could you describe those kind of uh, whatever qualities they had or those type of teachings that and, and advice they gave you that uh, helped you do all that? Well, I think the biggest thing that anybody needs to have is working in those kind of uh, positions is uh, patience. You know, they taught us, you know, it's not gonna happen overnight. You're gonna hit that brick wall, you're gonna hit it three or four times. You gotta keep going, keep going against it. And you're gonna find a way. And so that's what I did. I just kept, I was just kept trying and trying and Every time uh, I wanted to do something and we had to have it approved by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, that was the biggest obstacle that we had. And I, today, even today, I know, Sean, that we could do without the Bureau. They are an albatross to us around her neck, you know, we're holding them up. And when they first started the bureau, when it become a bureau, you know, they were supposed to be here until we could learn how to take care of ourselves. We, well, we can do that now. Look at you, you know. You could be any area director, you could be the head of the whole Bureau of Indian Affairs. You're qualified, and that's what they started out. We're gonna qualify. And when I went to uh, finally went to college, that uh, that superintendent denied my application. He said, "You go to college. When you come back, you can have my job." When I came back, what did I say? Well, I, no, I didn't say that. You know, of course, you couldn't hold them to it anyway. But I think we had the people that, uh, I worked for the Bureau before, you know, and all I was, uh, and the orientation that I, were, that I was given was, you can't do this. We tried that, that won't work. We, you know, we, all these excuses that I said, here's your keys. I, I can't go tell my people, that I can't do this or I can't do that. I can't help you. And I'm here to help. The Bureau is here is supposed to be to help us. But they hinder us more than anything. <laughs> uh, to me, and that's my own observation. But uh, I guess it's a necessary evil. I, I don't know. I, I think that we could do a lot more uh, in getting jobs and things like that if we had the money they spend, and we could use it over here. But they say the same thing about us. When you're on the count, when you're a bureau, oh, we can't let the tribe do this. We can't, you know, 
I heard that both sides, but I think that they're looking at what it was back in the 50s. You know, they're still there, but we're here now. You're president of the college, doctor's degree. I have a master's degree. And we have people out here that have all kinds of education and skills. And I know we could, we could run this place. Any place. Yeah. Right. We're still here. Mm -hmm. I know, I, I agree. In fact, you know, tribal colleges, when they were first uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning, you know, in the 70s, it was the bureau that was against tribal college. Mm -hmm. You bet. So it's just all going back to your boarding school days. It was, it's been ingrained in our Indian people's heads that we can't do those things but we prove time and time again that we can do yep. that so i don't know how long and how many times we have to prove to the bureau or to the department of education or whatever that we can do this we're qualified to do this uh, i don't know how many times we have to prove that before they will actually see it but the way I look at it is that, you know, we're, we're still a sub race to the dominant society. You know, we're still down here, even though we're probably more educated than uh, per capita wise than you know, yeah. the general public. And just like military, you know, we have more veterans here than per capita wise than the rest of the people, but uh, we're still second class, you know, to me. Uh, yeah. In their eyes, to me, I think I'm one of the greatest guys in the world. <laughs> I agree. And I have, I have my kids that thank me and tell me that every day, Dad, I'm really glad you did this. I'm glad you did that. This morning I had a conversation with my son, Beefy, and you know Beefy. Yeah. And he's, he's, he went from staggering down the street in Harlem trying to fight everybody to he's head of treatment center down in Fort Peck, Spotted Bull Treatment Center. I don't know if he's ahead of it, but he's working there. And he completely turned around, got his master's degree, and he's working on his master's right now. Yeah. But if you, if we could get our people to, Look at themselves. Who are you? Who are you? And if they could look in a mirror and write down, you know, I'm that old bloodshot eyed guy standing there shaking, twitching, and hungover. And pretty soon, if you don't like that, you have to change. So what do you change? You, know? you do your inventory. And it worked for me. I got tired of looking in that mirror, seeing that same old dirty stink guy standing there, you know. And the only guy who can change it is me. Yeah. We have to start making choices. Because when we look in that mirror, the choices that we've made so far got us to where we're at. Yeah. So we have to unlearn all those things that we learned that got us where we are. Yeah. But two fences over here, old way and the new way. We know that new way failed us because we're so out of shape and obese and cancer and everything else that we have to go back to this old way, some aspects of it, to get us back to that healthy, pure individual or tribal work. Yeah. And we need to do that. I, that's what I want to talk to you about uh, later on after we get done with this. Okay. Because I think uh, in your position, we can start having a little more say-so in what we're going to teach. Okay, yeah. 
I know one um, topic we haven't covered, and you're a, um, a famous artist. You're a, you know, you received the Folk Arts Award from the Montana Arts Council a few years back, and and uh, yeah. make pipes and things. And um, would yeah. you to that for for a little bit? Well, I'm glad you brought that up. I, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that you you do because somebody told you you can't do that. And those are all challenges to me. Everything that I've done that people look at and think of as something exceptional, nobody knows that I was a state boxing champion. Very few people know that, but I was. Very few people know that I have my master's degree from Harvard University. Uh, because we don't go, we don't advertise, we don't push ourselves out in front. Um, people didn't know that I had some artistic qualities in me. And I didn't know even. But one day we were down in uh, Gallup, New Mexico, and we were looking at Richardson's gift show or some gyp joint anyway, where they bought all this Navajo stuff for $75 and was selling it for $360 or $3,000, depending on what it was. Uh, and there was a pipe in there. And the price tag on that pipe was $3,000. And I know a Pipestone. I went to Flandre Indian School, Pipestone 15 miles away. I could do that, I told my wife. Well, why didn't you do that, she said. So we came home, I got a piece of Pipestone and I made me a pipe. And the rest is history. I made many, many pipes. I was, I gotta thank your father also. He, I think he nominated me for my award and but th there's things that we we do you know that nobody knows about us we don't uh, uh, talk about it in fact this summer probably in july i'm going to pipestone and we have to dig our own pipestone you you, you, you don't go down there and it's laying on the ground you dig through four feet of sod and about 10 feet of granite, hard, hard granite as there is at uh, Snake Butte. And then the pipestone is under that. And I've been doing that since 1995 or six sometime. Every year I go down. Well, I'm 82 now and I can't sing that sledgehammer anymore. So I'm taking my boys and some of the students that I have in my classes, my class that, uh, Husky and can handle that hammer, so we're going to go again this summer and get my pipe sewn. And yeah, uh, you bought a pipe for me for the college, and uh, you know uh, that's one of the things that I'm, I uh, I tell people go look at it, go see it over there. What do you do? What kind of pipe do you make? And I always tell them go see it. It's sitting in the display case over there. I don't know. If, I haven't been in it for years now, so. It's still there, yeah. Still there, great. Yeah, yeah well, thank you, Sean. I, uh, I kind of forgot about that, <laughs> even though I'm going to be going in a couple of months. Yeah, I don't wish I quite could. Awesome. I know, I wish I could join you too, but um, maybe that's part of the topic we'll talk about after the interview. Sure, sure. Well, um, well, I suppose I, uh, I think we're almost about an hour and uh, I know you have things to do and um, but I appreciated everything that you you shared here and I hope that our our community our students and our young people uh, looked to you as a role model and saw uh, all the struggles that yeah. more things to your life well the thing you know, the thing I Sean I think as far as uh, school or education is uh, 
I think we have to get back to teaching things uh, that really have a, a purpose. You know, we all have a purpose, every one of us. Maybe my purpose on this little purpose was to make pipes. I made many, many pipes for many sun dances and things like that, uh, you know, and things that we haven't talked about here. But uh, if you don't know your purpose, then you don't have anywhere to go. You don't have, you know, you can't set a goal. You know, you know, you. Uh, so I always tell my students, you're here for a purpose. Go find it. Go find that purpose. Some find it in one year. Some find it in five years. Some never find it. They're still drunk. You know, but it takes takes time to look at yourself. You're here for a purpose. And that purpose isn't to be an abuser or to be an alcoholic or a drug addict. You have a purpose. And the only way you're gonna find that purpose is to understand your ceremonies, participate in those ceremonies, listen to your spiritual leaders and your elders. They're going to stand you up and they're going to point you in the right direction. But you have to do that. That has to come from here. You have to decide yourself. Make the right choice. Well, thanks. I think we'll be a lot better off when we do. Yeah. I know that's one of the things that, I, you know, for the future of the college, um, you know, we, we have a uh, a good foundation, but I know there's always more we can do and uh, try to uh, get throughout the college and our education here. Yeah, because you never quit learning. Yeah. You know, in my classes, I learn more or as much as from them as they learn from me. You know, because they pretty soon they're finding out you know, what really makes them tick, it really makes them who they need to be or who they want to be. And something to go for. And if you don't have a purpose, you're not gonna have that. You're not gonna, you're not gonna meet those challenges that are out there. And everything is a challenge. We gotta look at that. That's what I looked at when I was, even when I was a little boy. When I ran away, <clears throat> the first time we ran away, we got down to the river. And two of the boys I ran away with were from Cannonball, North Dakota. One of them was from, uh, I can't remember the other place. And then two of us from here. And I said, I'll tell you what, boys. I said, all I know is I said, I have to go upstream. Well, we came this way. This is how we came. We got to go that way. No, I said, that's just the way the road is. Look, here's Montana, and I drew a little square for Montana, because I did have geography. And I drew a little square for North Dakota, another little square from South Dakota. I said, we're right here. The Missouri River runs all the way through here, right through Cannonball, Fort Gates, right to Pierre. So we have to go upstream. Oh, we're going to go with the road. I said, well, you guys go ahead. I'm going, and I took off because it was getting dark. Yeah. I ran for about 10 minutes and pretty soon I could hear them behind me they were coming up. Mm -hmm. and I told that story to Max Bacchus. He said, you know, that was your first leadership job. He says, you proved you were a leader. You got those guys to do it was right. That's one of the highest compliments I got ever. It's nice. It's nice. I'll tell you one more story. I know it's getting late, but oh, no. uh, uh, when I was boxing in high school at Fort Yates, and I won my state 1957 and 1959, my boxing coach, he was a 51 year old man when I was uh, on the track team and I used to stay with him. And 
I could have my tennis shoes on and he'd have an old pair of crooked heel boots on and he'd race me to the barn and that bugger would beat me. And here I was, a, a hundred man for our track team and he would beat me. And <clears throat> so when I came back from Harvard, I stopped in to see him because he was one of the guys that really inspired me you know, to be whatever I wanted to be. I said, you got the brains, you got the skills, you can do, and, and you got that want to. He said, you got that want to do it. And so when I came back from Harvard, I stopped to see him. And he was in a bed, he had a stroke. He couldn't move his right side, right hand. And I don't know how many times that right hand knocked me down when we trained, but he couldn't even move his right hand. And so I took him and I showed him my little certificate from Harvard. And he grabbed me and pulled me down to him with his left hand. He, he started crying. And then he let me go and he pointed at a little chalkboard that he had where he wrote messages and he put it down. And he wrote, that's one thing I liked about you, is you never ever quit. And you know, that that really made me feel good. That was one of the best compliments I ever had. Because in boarding school, you know, you could win a hundred yard dash, but there's nobody there to pat you on the back and say, nice run, son, or nice run, my nephew. You know, Nobody, just a coach. Hey, you could have done better. You, you know, you you never ever done good enough. But when, but he 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 seen it. And uh, I want to leave you with one thing, Sean. It's uh, <clears throat> you know nobody recognizes us for who we are as a people, Indians, except Charlie Russell. Charlie Russell said, and I think I showed it to you one time, Charlie Russell said, the Indian is the true American. His history is written in blood. Something all time can't grind out. He said, the earth was our mother, the sun was our God, all outdoors was their Bible, he said, and they knew every page. I thought that was uh, phenomenal. He's, you know, only guy ever, but nobody heard him. I did. When I seen that, I said, you know, this guy, he knows who we are. I use that in my classes. Yeah. That's a good good thought, good, uh, good quote. Yeah, it really is. So. Well, um, thank you again for uh, sharing some of your life with us. And uh, you know, I know our people here will uh, be grateful for that. So, so with that, I hope it helps somebody. yeah. So with that, I want to thank everybody for viewing this today and uh, we'll see you again. Not bad.